Well, good morning and welcome to Gig Harbor United Reformed Church and our morning worship services. We're glad that you've joined us on this beautiful Lord's Day morning to worship and praise our triune God. Uh, Just a few announcements before we get started. This upcoming Wednesday evening is our monthly men's fellowship gathering. And this month we'll be meeting at at our home at 7 p.m. And again, uh, we are continuing through uh, Carl Truman's book, A Strange New World. As always, after this first main communion service, we will have a time of fellowship and refreshment. And then at about 11.15, we will gather again for our catechism service in which we are considering the truth of God's word through the lens of the Belgic Confession. And this, uh, this morning, we're going to be turning our attention to the importance of belonging or being a member of Christ's church. In this age. So we'd love for you to stick around for that if you are able. Well, you should have received an order of worship on your way in, and you should also find a Psalter hymnal in your pew. If you don't have either of these two items, I'd encourage you uh, to grab them as we'll be making use of them as we seek to worship our God in an acceptable manner. You'll also notice that there are certain portions in your order of worship that are set off in italicized print. This indicates, again, the times and places in which you as a congregation will be active in in the worship of our Lord this morning. Well, please stand, if you're able, for our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand In his holy place, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Well, our God is indeed the creator and sustainer of of all that exists. And so how can we as sinful creatures stand in his holy presence? How can we ascend his holy hill? Well, we need clean hands and a pure heart. There's only been one person who's ever lived who's had clean hands and a pure heart. And that person is our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we come into God's presence this morning, pleading the name of our intercessor and mediator, Jesus Christ himself. So let us pray responsively, asking that the Lord would accept our worship this morning for Christ's sake. Incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Visit us and accept our worship today in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, in Christ, your God blesses you in this holy moment. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. Well, let us respond to our God's gracious invitation this morning to worship his name and be in his holy presence by turning to number 24b. This is a setting of Psalm 24, and we'll be singing stanzas 1 through 3. So 24b, stanzas 1 through 3.
may be seated. Our God speaks to us in his law in order to remind us that the main problem that we face in life is not the lack of, of, of fulfillment or satisfaction with our current circumstances. It's not that our culture may be too progressive. The problem of mankind is that they stand under the wrath of God, the condemnation of God because of their sin. So here now the law of our God which comes to us both from the seventh commandment and from Ephesians chapter 5. Our God says, and you shall not commit adultery. The Apostle Paul continues saying, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral, or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. What is pleasing to the Lord. Well, here the Apostle Paul reminds us, admonishes us, that the seventh commandment not only forbids the physical act of adultery, but it also has a, a much farther reach. Paul is saying here that the seventh commandment forbids all sexual immorality. Paul is telling us here that the seventh commandment forbids all filthiness, crude joking. Indeed, Paul says that these things must not even be named among the saints, among Christ's people. Now, Paul here doesn't, doesn't tell us exactly how we should engage in culture. The church in Ephesus found itself in a very pagan and secular city and culture. Paul doesn't tell them exactly how they should spend their Saturday afternoon or Tuesday evening. And nor does he tell us how we are to engage in culture. We are to try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. We have to use our own sanctified wisdom to discern how we can live pure lives in the midst of a very se uh, sexualized and secular world and culture. We have to try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Now notice the threat, the threat of God's law. God says that if you are guilty of the seventh commandment, if you stole a lustful glance this week, if you found yourself daydreaming about things that you should not be daydreaming about, coveting someone who is not properly yours or, or some other breach or sin of the seventh commandment, Paul is saying that apart from Christ, you have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Paul says that apart from Christ, God's wrath is directly channeled upon you. This is what God's law says to those who are under the law. God's law speaks this way so that every mouth may be stopped and so that the whole world might be held accountable to him. We are meant to be humbled as we gaze into the mirror of God's law and confess our sins, confess the ways in which we've been negligent, confess the ways in which we have not faithfully sought to obey God's will for our lives in this seventh commandment. Let us then confess our sins using the words that are given to us from our forefather David, which are found in your order of worship. So please follow along with me as we pray, not only with our lips, but especially with our hearts, saying, O oh Lord, when we keep silent, our bones waste away through our groaning all day long. For day and night your hand is heavy upon us. Our strength is dried up as by the heat of summer. We acknowledge our sins to you, and we do not cover our iniquity. We confess our transgressions to you, and you forgive the iniquity of our sin. 
Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. In this moment of silent confession, we bring you our particular sins. Amen. The Apostle Paul tells us, who, who shall deliver us from this body of death? Well, thanks be to God that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And so please stand as God announces over us another word, a word of gospel, which is for you and for your children. For congregation of Christ, if you have confessed your sins this morning and are trusting and the finished work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. You can be assured, no matter how your week has gone, no matter what sins your conscience may be presently accusing you of, you may be assured, as I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ and on the authority of his infallible word, that as far as the east is from the west, so far has the Lord removed all of your transgressions, your past transgressions, your present transgressions, and even your future transgressions. Amen. Well, let us lift up our voices in grateful response as we sing forth the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Please remain standing and turn in your order of worship to the confession of faith element. Uh, G.K. Chesterton once said that man is supposed to be doubtful about himself, but undoubting about the truth. We as moderns very much have this reversed. We oftentimes find ourselves undoubting about ourselves and doubtful about God's truth. The Nicene Creed reminds us that we are to subject ourselves, our intellect, our emotions, our feelings to the truth of God's word, not only as it's found in inerrant scripture, but also as it's confessed in the creeds and confessions of the historic church. And so Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, 
who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue to respond to that good news that we now have access to God uh, through the mediation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we now boldly approach God in heaven, praying to him, lifting up before him the request of our heart, confident that we are heard because we pray in the name of Christ our Savior. Let us pray. Merciful Father, you are a God who dwells in unapproachable light, sharing all glory, power, and status with the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yet despite your moral and ontological distinction from us as your creatures, you have accommodated, condescended yourself to us in our finite capacity. Indeed, O oh Lord, you have risked being grossly misunderstood that we might have some fruition of who you are. You, as our merciful and gracious God, have ordained to hear our prayers for the sake of the mediation of your Son. May these, these your prayers arise to your throne as a pleasing aroma in your sight. O Lord, we pray for your universal church, a church that is scattered across this globe. We thank you, O Lord, that your Son continues to build and preserve and defend this church through his spirit and word. We thank you, O Lord, that we, as members of local churches, are also members of this one holy Catholic and apostolic church. O Lord, we pray this morning for Reverend Lee Irons as he continues as the church planting pastor in Santa Clarita, California. We pray that you would raise up men with the qualifications, wisdom, and desire to care for your people as elders and deacons. We pray, O oh Lord, that this church plant would one day become a self-sustaining, particularized church within Classes Southwest. We pray for their ministry efforts, the students at the local university in their community who are learning Reformed theology. Lord, we also pray for this congregation, the Gig Harbor URC. We thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you for your faithfulness through uh, these past number of years. We thank you for the people whom you have brought uh, to this local household of faith. We ask, O oh Lord, that we would see your worship service, that we participate in each, each Lord's Day as a divine service a service in which you are serving and feeding us. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would come to appreciate the importance of the preaching of the word, not because you value the intellect more than our other human faculties, but because preaching is a medium where we are recipients and not doers. O oh Lord, may we see the Lord's Supper not as a meal that we are preparing for you, but a meal in which we are the guests and you are the hosts and our elders are the waiters. May we come to embrace that we are not the active agents in our baptisms, but we are those who have been baptized. May the weekly divine service that we participate in straighten our posture, a posture which is naturally curved in on itself, that we might look up to you and out towards our neighbor in love. O oh Lord, we pray for uh, the civil magistrates, the servants that you have ordained and set up to serve us in temporal affairs. This morning we pray for President Biden and Vice President Harris. We pray for Governor Inslee and for all of our local and appointed officials. We ask, O oh Lord, that your, your common grace would be upon them, restraining them from wickedness and vice. We pray that they would promote a society that is pleasing to you. We pray that they would seek to protect uh, uh, the vulnerable, the, uh, un uh, the oppressed, and even the unborn. 
Oh Lord, we pray for your people gathered here in Gig Harbor. We ask your mercy to be upon those who are struggling with various physical afflictions. We continue to pray for Noelle as she undergoes her monthly infusions. We pray that you would preserve and strengthen her body. We continue to pray for Candace Obeski's dad as he um, continues on the long road of recovery from his work accident. We continue to pray your, your healing to be upon Tom. Uh, we pray for Madison's grandfather as he also is in the long road of recovery as he heals from his, his back surgery. And we pray for others among us who, who are sick, who are, who are ill, who are not feeling well, who are suffering from various afflictions or weaknesses of their body. Oh Lord, we pray that your mercy would be upon them. We also pray for those who struggle, who suffer from, from illnesses of the mind, from a psychological or emotional distress. We pray that your peace and your comfort would surround them as the mountains surround Jerusalem. Oh Lord, no matter what trials or tribulations plague us in this veil of tears, we pray that you would strengthen us. Strengthen us by the power of Christ himself to find contentment in every and any circumstance we find ourselves in. Oh Lord, we pray for the families of Gig Harbor URC. And this morning we specifically pray for, for Hannah Dottel. We thank you for how she has been serving us, using her musical gifts so that we can uh, better sing praises to you in corporate worship. We ask that you would continue to equip her with your spirit to fulfill the various callings and vocations that you have laid upon her in the season of her life. And we pray that you would provide the desires of her heart that are in accordance with your will. Oh Lord, we also pray for uh, the other families within our church. We pray for those who are single. Uh, we pray for those who are single and desire a spouse. We ask that you would grant, grant them uh, this desire, this good desire of, of their hearts. We pray for those who are married and are praying and desiring the gift of children. Again, we pray that you would, you would minister to them in this trying season. We pray that you would also provide for them in this way. Oh Lord, we pray for those who are in the throes of parenting children within the home. We ask that you give them patience. We ask that you would give them strength and energy. We pray that you would um, continue to grant them faithfulness as they seek to raise their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Oh uh, Lord, we pray for those among us who have adult children. We ask that you grant them wisdom as they navigate this, this new and unique season of life. We pray that you would also allow them to be a voice of wisdom to, uh, to their children. We pray for the marriages within our church. We, we thank you for uh, this, this blessed institution, we pray that you would grant us strength as husbands and as wives uh, to put the needs of, of our spouse ahead of our own. Oh Lord, in all of our various relationships, may we be quick to confess our sin, quick to run to Christ, and quick to look out to our neighbor in love. Oh Lord, we also thank you for the covenant children that you've blessed our congregation with. We pray that they would learn to embrace not only you as father, but your church as mother. We ask, O oh Lord, that our youth would grow up to value church membership, the public means of grace, the shepherding and discipline of elders, and the community and life of the church. We pray that in the years to come, wherever they may find themselves in this world, they would prioritize your gathered and visible body here on earth. Oh Lord, we also pray for those of us who serve you throughout the week in common vocations. We ask that you give us wisdom. We ask that you grant us uh, uh, strength that we might do our, our duties with diligence. Oh Lord, we pray for those who, who serve in the military. We thank you for safely um, bringing home Bobby uh, Sobeski and Joshua Gilbert. Uh, we pray for Ben and Brandon. Uh, we pray that you would continue to equip them. We thank you for, for their service to us. We pray for the first responders within our congregation. Uh, we thank you for granting Max what he stood in need of as he was able to pass his exam yesterday. We continue to pray for William as he uh, learns and trains in the police academy. Uh, we uh, pray for Tom. We pray for Ivy. We pray that you protect them and bless them as they serve our communities. Oh Lord, we pray for our sanctification. We thank you that you have given to us your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would continue to slay the old man within us and bring to life that new man. Give us a delight in walking according to your law and all manner of good works. May we be a people who, are, who, are, who embrace the identity of being children of light. May we walk in purity as we live in a very impure world. 
Grant us wisdom as we seek to discern what is pleasing to you. As we now turn to hear you speak to us in both your written and preached word, we pray that we would not only hear, read, and learn this word, but we ask through the power of your spirit that we would inwardly digest your holy scriptures, that we might grow in conformity to your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 25. This morning we'll be reading verses 19 through 34. Genesis 25 verses 19 through 34. This passage is the transition from the life of Abraham to the life of Isaac. We have been considering the life of Abraham ever since Genesis chapter 12. And now, with this passage, the author is transitioning to the next patriarch, Abraham's son, Isaac. But please turn your attention to the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Genesis chapter 25, beginning in verse 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright, birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Genesis 25, this passage before us is about God's sovereignty in salvation. Genesis 25 is about God's sovereignty and salvation. Now there are many terms that people employ to describe God's sovereignty and salvation. 
You may have heard of the term of election or predestination or Calvinism. Now these terms are the boogeyman to some, abused by others, and treasured by the rest. One of our confessional documents, the Canons of Dorts, this is one of our confessional documents that doesn't get quite as much attention. The Canons were a response to the teachings of Jacob Arminius. Jacob Arminius was a reformed minister and pastor in the 17th, or 16th and 17th centuries. He began to teach things that were contrary to the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. He began to teach, essentially, that God was not fully sovereign in salvation. He began to teach that God's election was not based on the good pleasure of God's will, but rather it was based in part on human will and exertion. Well, the Dutch Reformed Church at this time responded to the teachings of Arminius and his followers by calling an international Reformed Synod. This Synod's response to Arminius was the Canons of Dort. The Canons of Dort were the response to Arminius. Now, the delegates of this Synod believed that the heart of the Reformation, indeed the solas of the Reformation, were at stake in this controversy, this controversy over God's sovereignty in salvation. Thus, is this an important issue? Is this an important doctrine? Our forefathers in the faith would have said that it was important. And God says that it is important. God desires that we understand this doctrine for the sake of our comfort. Indeed, the Apostle Paul agrees. In Romans chapter 9, the Apostle Paul cites Genesis 25 as he seeks to explain the doctrine of election or God's sovereignty in salvation Paul, in Romans 9, extracts doctrine from the drama or narrative of the book of Genesis. This reminds us that Genesis 25 isn't merely a a story about a barren woman who eventually conceives and gives birth to twins. No, this story is about us. This story is about God's sovereignty in our salvation. That is how the Apostle Paul interprets Genesis 25 for us in the book of Romans. Genesis 25 is about God's sovereignty in our, in your salvation. This chapter then, this section is about God's sovereignty in your salvation. Now boys and girls, what does the word sovereignty mean? (laughs) Well, it means that God has power and control over Salvation. It means that God is the author of salvation. It also means that God is the deliverer of salvation. God is the mailman when it comes to salvation. You don't go out and take hold of your salvation. God is the one who delivers it to your doorstep. God is sovereign in our salvation. Now, God's sovereignty and salvation is displayed in this passage in three distinct scenes. God's sovereignty and salvation is displayed in this passage in three distinct scenes. And it's these three distinct scenes that we're going to turn our attention to. We see, first of all, Rebecca conceiving twins in the midst of her barrenness. We see Jacob's election while he's still in the womb. And we see Esau selling his birthright. In these three distinct scenes, we learn about God's sovereignty in our salvation. As I said before, with this passage, we now are transitioning from the life of Abraham to the life of his son, Isaac. Now, Isaac and Rebekah are facing a very difficult problem, trial in this passage. Rebecca's barren. She's infertile. Now, of course, this is a very, very difficult and painful trial for anybody to walk through, but it was especially difficult 
for Isaac and Rebekah because God's promises, God's promises to save his people from their sins, God's promises to bless every family of the earth was contingent upon Rebekah having children, upon Rebekah having a son. Now, of course, you recall that Isaac's parents, Abraham and Sarah, also dealt with this problem. Sarah was barren, was infertile for years upon years. How did they handle this trial? Well, at times they trusted God, but at other times they failed to trust God. At other times they they desired to help God out. They tried at times to take things into their own hands. Do you remember what Sarah did? Do you remember when she... Uh, she, she either thought that God had forgotten his promise or that God, God's hand was too short to fulfill his promise. Sarah, Sarah tried to help God out by seeking a surrogate child through her servant, Hagar. And so what does Isaac do here? Does Isaac follow in the footsteps of his mother and his father? No, Isaac trusts God. Isaac patiently trust God. Isaac perseveres in prayer. In fact, Isaac is the only patriarch who remains monogamous. Isaac does not seek to help God out by taking a concubine or seeking a surrogate child through Rebekah's servant. Isaac patiently trusts God and perseveres in prayer. How long does Isaac pray? How long does Isaac pray? Well, in verse 20, we read that Isaac is 40 years old when he begins to pray. And then if you look in verse 26, we see that when Rebekah gives birth to Jacob and Esau, how old is Isaac? 60 years old. Isaac prayed 20 years for his wife to conceive a child. Isaac is a remarkable example and demonstration of patience and trust and persevering in prayer. Isaac prayed 20 years, 20 years for his barren wife to conceive a child. Now what does this scene, this scene of Rebecca conceiving children in the midst of her barrenness, what does this, what does this scene teach us about God's sovereignty in our salvation? What does this scene teach us about God's sovereignty in our salvation? One prominent theme that we see throughout Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, is God building his church through the wombs of barren women. God building his church through the wombs of barren women. This theme climaxes with the Virgin Mary, who is the ultimate barren woman. She conceives the Lord Jesus Christ apart from human means. God builds his church through the wombs of barren, infertile women. Now let's take Sarah as an example. Again, Sarah has essentially two children. And Paul in, in Galatians tells us that Ishmael, Sarah's surrogate child, is a picture of salvation through works of the law. Sarah sought to bring about God's promise through her own efforts with the birth of Ishmael. Ishmael is a picture of salvation through works of the law. Now Isaac, Paul tells us, is a picture of salvation by grace alone. Abraham and Sarah could take no credit for the birth of Isaac because Sarah was well past childbearing years. This was a miraculous act of God in fulfilling his promise to our forefather. Isaac then is a picture of divine salvation. Thus, as we think about this theme, this prominent theme of God building his church through the wombs of barren women, this theme teaches us that salvation is a divine work apart from human effort. Salvation is a divine work apart from human effort. That's what this scene teaches us. Salvation is a divine work apart 
from human efforts. We can no more take credit for our salvation than Rebecca or Sarah could take credit for their pregnancies in the midst of their infertility. Salvation is a divine work apart from human effort. How are we to respond to this revelation? Just as Isaac prayed, persevered in prayer for 20 years, we too are to persevere in prayer for the salvation of others. We are to persevere in prayer for those who are barren, not just in a literal sense, but in a spiritual sense. For those who are unable to save themselves. For those who are unable to cause themselves to be born again. We are to persevere in prayer. Now, if God is not sovereign, if God is not sovereign in salvation, then our prayers are merely a therapeutic exercise of subjectivity. If God is not sovereign, then our prayers are in the same category as modern mindfulness techniques or meditation or doing daily yoga. It's merely a therapeutic exercise of subjectivity. But if it, God is sovereign, then our prayers have an objective nature to them. If God is sovereign, then our prayers actually do something. Salvation is a divine work apart from human efforts. Well, after Isaac prays for 20 years, Rebecca conceives. He con she conceives in her womb. And we learn here in this passage that she has a difficult pregnancy. She has a difficult pregnancy. She laments to God. God, I've waited all these years for a child and now you're going to give me a difficult pregnancy? Why me? Why do I have to go through this trouble? Now what's God's response to Rebecca? Well, God responds with a prophecy. God responds by personally speaking to Rebecca. And what does God say? He essentially says, surprise, you're having twins. Not one nation, but two nations are in your womb. The end of this prophecy, God says something very important. He says, the older shall serve the younger. The older shall serve the younger. God is telling Rebekah that it's not her firstborn who's going to receive the Abrahamic promises, who's going to be the inheritor of the Abrahamic covenant, who's going to be the, the son of promise. No, it's going to be the younger son. It's going to be Jacob. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in interpretation of, of this short phrase in Genesis 25. Paul says this in Romans chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. Also, when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older shall serve the younger, as it is written in Malachi, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. God elected Jacob while he was still in Rebekah's womb in order to make it abundantly clear that his election is not based on human will or exertion. It's not based on foreseen faith or inherent righteousness, but rather God's election is based upon the good pleasure of his own will. Indeed, Jacob's reprehensible character, which we will see at play in the weeks to come, also serves to make this point. God didn't choose Jacob because Jacob was somehow intrinsically more righteous or holy than his brother Esau. God's election is based on him who calls. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 9. Now we might hear this, and this might cause us to, to bristle a little bit. We might think, how dare God infringe upon our autonomy? 
We're the ones who determine the outcome of our life. We are the ones who choose to be Christians. How dare God infringe upon our freedom, our autonomy? Well, Paul anticipates this objection in the following verses in Romans chapter 9. He says, you will say to me then, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has uh, the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Paul's telling us here that uh, we can either shake our fist at God or we can accept with humility God's revelation. As creatures, we're not going to fully understand this doctrine. We have uh, but a, a peephole glimpse into this doctrine. We understand this doctrine as creatures, not as the creator. As we embrace this revelation of God's will, we are to do so recognizing that God gives us this doctrine for the sole purpose of our comfort. God gives us this doctrine for the sole purpose of our comfort. God does not give us this doctrine in order to cause us to question our salvation. God gives us this doctrine to comfort us, to build us up in Christ. And I love how Martin Luther describes the comfort of God's electing love. I've shared this with you before, but in his 95 theses, he contrasts human love with God's electing love. He, he speaks about how human love is by nature reactive. The reason why you married your spouse, the reason why your best friends are your best friends is because you notice something attractive in those people. And those attractive qualities cause you to draw close to them. We naturally do not draw close to people in whom we see nothing attractive, nothing commendable. Our love is reactive. It reacts to inherent beauty or attraction that we see in other people. Well, thanks be to God that his love is not reactive. God does not look through the channels of time and elect those uh, who first choose him. Elect those who first loved him. God's love is not reactive. He does not react to inherent virtue or righteousness in mankind. No, God's love is creative. God sets his love upon people who are dead in their sins and trespasses. God sets his love upon those who naturally hate him. God sets his love upon those who want nothing to do with him, but then he makes something beautiful from these dead corpses. He regenerates, 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 justifies, sanctifies, and will one day glorify a sinful people. God's love is creative. Again, this doctrine is meant to humble us. It's meant to bring us to our knees. It's meant to to cause doxology to well up and overflow in our hearts. This is the love of God in Christ Jesus, for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so what does this scene, what does this scene teach us about God's sovereignty and salvation? Well, it teaches us that we do not choose God, God chooses us. It teaches us that we do not take the first step towards God, God takes that step towards us. God's love is creative. Again, boys and girls, how much credit can you take for being a part of your family? How much credit can you take for being born into the family that you were born into? Nothing. You had no control over who your parents are. Well, so too, uh, we can take no credit for being part of God's family. God is the one. God is the one who sovereignly places us in his family, and in his church. God is sovereign in our salvation. Well, Esau and Jacob are born. Uh, they grow up. We learn towards the end of this passage that Esau is a hairy man. Esau is a man of the fields. Esau is a hunter. Uh, one commentator I was reading this week uh, referred to Esau as the first redneck, which may be an apt description of him. 
He seems to be a nearsighted individual, uh, not very intellectual, not a great deep thinker, while Jacob is very much the opposite. He's civilized, a, a bit more sophisticated. He's a tent dweller. He is not as nearsighted as his brother, but he is thinking about the future and planning accordingly. Well, one day, Esau is working out in the fields all day, and he comes home famished. His blood sugar has plummeted, and he needs a meal. And so what does nearsighted Esau do? Well, he asks his brother Jacob, who is boiling a pot of stew, for a bowl of lentil stew. Well, Jacob, who is thinking about the future, sees this as a very strategic opportunity. And so he says to his brother Esau, let's make a deal. How about you sell me your birthrights, and I will give you a bowl of my lentil stew. Well, what does nearsighted Esau think and do? Well, he thinks and says to himself, what, what value is my birthright right now? I'm about to die of hunger. I need food. Esau agrees to this deal, sells his birthright for this bowl of lentil stew. Now, what is a birthright? What's the significance of this birthright? Well, birthright refers to the rights of the firstborn. The firstborn naturally had privilege and status. The firstborn would receive a double portion of his father's inheritance. Within the Abrahamic family, the firstborn was the one who inherited, inherited the Abrahamic covenant and promises. The firstborn would be the son of promise through whom Christ would come. The birthright then was very significant. We're told at the end of this passage that Esau despised his birthright. Esau had no regard for God's promises or the Abrahamic covenant or his birthright. Indeed, he valued a bowl of lentil stew over such things. Now, God didn't make him act in this way. He acted in this way according to his own volition. Esau despised his birthright. In the same way, Back in Noah's day, Noah didn't have to peel people off of the ship. The people of Noah's day mocked him. They wanted nothing to do with God's method of deliverance. We see then here in this scene that God not only elects some unto salvation, but he also passes over others, leaving them to their own devices as a demonstration of his justice. What happens when God leaves sinners to their own devices? They don't naturally come closer to God. They naturally run from God. What happens when God leaves Esau to his own sinful devices? He despises his birthright. He despises the promises of God. He despises the Abrahamic covenant. This is what sinners do, apart from the grace of God. We see then here in this scene the corollary to election, reprobation. God elects some but passes over others, leaving them to their own sinful devices as a demonstration of his justice. God does not make people dis uh, disbelieve. God is not responsible for the person who rejects him. Rather, God passes over them and leaves them to their own devices. We see here God's justice within his sovereignty. Of course, uh, we are creatures. We do not know who the elect are. We do not know who the reprobate are. And we are, not, we are not to ask that question. Indeed, the New Testament reminds us that we are to treat everyone with whom we come into contact with as a member of God's elect. We are to promiscuously preach and proclaim the gospel with, 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 with a genuine appeal, viewing everybody as a member of God's elect. In this passage, we are called essentially to, to imitate Isaac and not Jacob. Jacob isn't off the hook here. Jacob essentially imitates his grandparents. Jacob, rather than patiently waiting for God to fulfill his promise and give him the birthright, he does what Sarah did in seeking a surrogate child through Hagar. He, he tries to secure God's promise through his own efforts. We then here are called to imitate Isaac and his patience and trust and persevering prayer and not Jacob. 
And all too often, uh, we imitate Jacob and not Isaac. Uh, Isaac. All too often, when things get tough, we, our, our faith seems to flounder. All too often, when things get tough, we grow impatient. All too often, when things get tough, we lose heart in prayer. If this is all this passage taught us, then uh, that would be pretty bad news. But the main thrust of this passage is not what we can do for God. The main thrust of this passage is what God has already done for us. God has set his electing love upon us before the foundation of the world. God has foreordained the good works that you will walk in and has promised to provide all that you stand in need of so that you can fulfill each and every one of those good works. This is is what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If God then is sovereign over salvation, if God is sovereign over all of life, how can we then not trust him? How can we then not patiently expect all good from his hand? How can we not persevere in prayer? In a few moments, God will invite us to not only hear, hear of his electing love for us in Christ, but he also will invite us to experience this electing love tangibly in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Let us pray. Merciful Father, we thank you for your sovereignty. We thank you, O Lord, that we are not the author of our own salvation. We thank you, O Lord, that you are the, 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 the author and the finisher of our redemption. O Lord, we pray that this revelation of your will for us would not strike fear in our hearts, but we pray that it would comfort us. We pray that it would build us up in love. We pray that it would motivate our evangelistic efforts as we seek to promiscuously proclaim your gospel to all those who would hear. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, to all of you who have with a godly sorrow confessed your sins and affirm true faith in Jesus Christ, the promise of Jesus is sure. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. While remaining bread and wine, these sacred elements nevertheless become so united to the reality that they signify that we do not doubt, but joyfully believe that we receive in this meal, by the Spirit and through faith, nothing less than the crucified body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. If you are visiting with us this morning and have not been baptized in the name of the triune God and are not a member of another Christian Protestant church, we would admonish you to abstain and uh, speak to myself or one of our elders after the service. But if you have professed true faith in Jesus Christ and are a part of his body here on earth, you are invited to this table. Not because you are worthy in yourself, but because you've been dressed in Christ's perfect righteousness. Do not allow the weakness of your faith nor your failures in the Christian life to keep you from this table. For it was given to you because of your weaknesses and because of your failures in order to feed you with the precious body and blood of our dear Savior. So come, believing sinners, the table is ready. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who by the blood of your only begotten Son has secured for us a new and living way into the Holy of Holies, cleanse our minds and hearts by your word and spirit, that we, your redeemed people, drawing close to you through this holy sacrament, may enjoy fellowship with the Holy Trinity through the body and blood of Christ our Savior. We know that our ascended Savior does not live in temples made by hands, but is in heaven 
where he continues to intercede on our behalf. Through this sacrament, by your own word and spirit, may these common elements now be set apart from ordinary use and consecrated by you so that just as truly as we eat and drink these elements by which our bodily life is sustained, so truly we receive into our souls for our spiritual life, the true body and true blood of Christ. We receive these gifts by faith, which is the hand and mouth of our souls. Amen. Let us now go to our heavenly table and receive the gift of God for our souls. By the promise of God, this bread and wine are for us, the body and blood of Christ. O congregation, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. This time I'd like to invite uh, Elder Whit forward to distribute uh, the elements. And if you all could proceed forward, beginning with the, the front pews. And then once we are all seated, we will partake together. Thank you. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Take, eat, remember and believe that the precious body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken for the complete forgiveness of all your sins.
The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Take, drink, remember and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was poured out for the complete remission of all your sins. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of this holy feast. Although we are unworthy to share this meal with you, it is by your invitation and dressing Christ's righteousness that we have come boldly into the Holy of Holies. Instead of wrath, we have received your pardon. In the place of fear, we have been given hope. Our high priest and mediator of the new covenant has reconciled us to you, even now intercedes for us at your right hand. Please strengthen us by these gifts, so that relying only on your promise to save sinners who call on Jesus' name, we may, by your spirit, honor you with our souls and bodies, to the honor and glory of your holy name. Amen. Well, please stand as we respond to God's word and sacrament this morning by... Uh, lifting up our voices and praising God for his sovereignty. So please turn to number 233. We'll be singing stanzas 1 through 4. You may be seated. At this time, we'll continue to worship our God through the giving of an offering. If you're visiting with us, you are under no obligation to give, but as we do give, we remember the generosity of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became poor, so that by his poverty, we too might become rich.
Please stand as we continue to respond in song by lifting up our voices and singing the Gloria Pottery. Receive now God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift upon you his countenance and give you peace. Amen. Please enjoy this time of fellowship and refreshments. And then at about 1115, we'll gather again for our catechism service. Thank you. Please hang on to your order of worship as well as your Psalter hymnal as you are finding your seats to take any prayer requests that you may have. Yes? Uh, just uh, Ben and the Ben flew out this morning. He's going to be gone for the month. He's doing a training out in the desert in California. So just for him doing that and him and Leah, is there a part for, for their marriage that was kind of separated? Thank you. Yes, Kathy. Um, for uh, Maya, she's been sick all week, and mm. so she hasn't been able to do any practice, and she's having to star play next weekend, so we're kind of stressing out about that. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you. Well, thank you for those requ uh, requests. Uh, please stand if you're able for our call to worship this morning, which comes from Titus 1 9 and Hebrews 13, verse 17. Paul says that he, an elder, must hold firm to the trust, trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And then the author to the Hebrews says to us all, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. When the service God is teaching us about the importance of belonging to his church, the one holy Catholic and, and apostolic church. And part of what it means to belong to the church is that we submit. Uh, we submit to the entire body of the church and we submit to the church's leadership. Well, let us respond to this call to worship by lifting up our voices and declaring our love for God's kingdom. Please turn to number 405. We'll be singing stanzas one through four. Apostle Paul calls us to give thanks for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, in this service, we continue to seek to inculcate the habit of thanksgiving and gratitude. And so let us lift up our voices and pray together this corporate prayer of thanksgiving, which is printed for you in your order of worship. So let's pray not only with our lips, but especially with our hearts, saying, Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, do give you most humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless you for our creation, our preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, your inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we ask you, give us that due sense of all your mercies, that our hearts may be sincerely thankful, and that we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Well, God, on the Lord's Day, desires to instruct us, teach us, build us up through his word. The main way in which we 
um, digest the word of God is to be through the public means of grace on the Lord's day. And so in Psalm chapter 1, the psalmist speaks about the importance of meditating upon the law of the Lord, upon the word of God. Again, in that original context, the way in which an Israelite would have heard the word of God would have been publicly, as it was declared and taught to them by the priest. The way the early Christians in the New Testament would have heard the word of God would have been not, not privately, because no one would have had a personal copy of the Bible. They would have heard it as they gathered with their fellow church members on the Lord's Day. And so the main way in which we digest the word of God is in settings like this on the Lord's Day as we gather with the people of God. So let us stand and turn to number 1B as we declare with our mouths the importance of meditating upon God's Word. So please turn to 1B. We'll be singing stanzas 1, one through 3. seated. Uh, please turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 verses 1 through 10. Galatians chapter 6 verses 1 through 10. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Please pay careful attention, for this is God's holy and inspired word to us. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. 
Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, please look with me now in your order of worship. This morning we are confessing together the truth of Belgic Confession, Article 28. Belgic Confession, Article 28. In Galatians chapter 6, we, we learn about the importance of belonging to the church for the purpose of serving one another within the church. The only way we can serve one another is if we are in community with one another. And we find that community within the church of Jesus Christ. And so in Belgic Confession, Article 28, we are confessing the truth about what it means to belong to the church, what it means to belong to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. As always, we will recite together the truth of this article. And so Christian, what do you believe about church membership? We believe that since this holy assembly and congregation is the gathering of those who are saved, and there is no salvation apart from it, no one ought to withdraw from it, content to be by himself, regardless of his status or condition. But all people are obliged to join and unite with it, keeping the unity of the church by submitting to its instruction and discipline, by bending their necks under the yoke of Jesus Christ, and by serving to build up one another according to the gifts God has given them as members of each other in the same body. And to preserve this unity more effectively, it is the duty of all believers, according to God's word, to separate themselves from those who do not belong to the church in order to join this assembly wherever God has established it, even if civil authorities and royal decrees forbid and death and physical punishment result. And so all who withdraw from the church or do not join it act contrary to God's ordinance. Let us pray and ask that the Lord would blessing the pre, uh, bless the preaching and teaching of his word. Merciful Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. We, as we um, have witnessed the beauty of your creation, even this Lord's Day morning, we are cognizant of, of the grandeur of your creation. Uh, your creation, O oh Lord, serves as a book that points, uh, points us back to, to its author, O oh Lord, you do exist as the creator and sustainer of all that, that exists. But we thank you, O oh Lord, most of all that you have revealed yourself, especially to your people uh, in Holy Scripture. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you have preserved this book for us so that we can be here right now gathered as this body to hear, to read, to learn, to inwardly digest uh, your truth this morning that we might grow ever in conformity to your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, boys and girls, again, we have, uh, God has made us, but with hearts and mouths. And so what are we called to do with our hearts and with our mouths? Yes. Believe and confess. Believe and confess. And we believe and confess God to be what? What is God? What is God? What is God? Noel? Single, simple, and spiritual. And this single, simple, simple, and spiritual being called God is revealed in what, what two books? What two books? How is God revealed to us? Violet? The Bible and creation. The Bible and creation. And speaking about the Bible, what is the Bible? What is the Bible? What is the Bible? What are the attributes of the Bible? Isaiah? Good, the inspired, authoritative, and sufficient word of God. Because God's word is inspired, which means that um, it's God's book, not man's book. It, therefore, is authoritative, and it's sufficient. We don't need to look to other, 
other books, other sources um, for infallible revelation. Now, the Bible is all about God from beginning to end. It's about our triune God. And so what is the Trinity? What is the Trinity? Lillian? One essence. One essence in three persons. And within the Trinity, Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. That's the, the title he has, the identity he has. And the Holy Spirit is, uh, proceeds eternally from the Father and the Son. Our triune God is the author of creation and providence. Our triune God is the author of creation and providence. A creator, our first parents, Adam and Eve, and placed them in the Garden of Eden. But we know, we know how that story went. Uh, they fell from that state of original innocency. Um, and so what do we believe about original sin? What do we believe about original sin? Uh, Annalise? In Adam's sin, sinned we all. In Adam's sin, sinned we all. God's sin leads to God's grace. And that's the transition that the Belgian Confession makes as well. And so we've been reflecting upon God's grace, God's grace uh, in eternity. God's grace in eternity is, is found in election, what we, what we thought about earlier this morning in Genesis 25. God set his love upon those who are his before the foundation of the world. We consider God's grace in history. After Adam and Eve sinned, he made a covenant of grace with Adam and Eve. And that covenant of grace extends throughout the Bible. Uh, we are members of that covenant of grace. Uh, we consider God's grace defined in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ has two natures in one person. We've also looked at God's grace um, accomplished at the cross. Jesus, Jesus bore the wrath of his father as he died on the cross. Uh, we've turned our attention to God's grace applied. God applies grace to our hearts by giving us true faith. And boys and girls, what, what member of the Trinity grants us or kindles true faith in our hearts? What member of the Trinity? Marcus? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Very good. The Holy Spirit creates true faith in our heart by the preaching of the Holy Gospel. Uh, we then are justified by faith. Uh, justification is God forgiving us of our sins and imputing to us the righteousness of Christ. All those who are justified are sanctified, or inwardly renewed by the Holy Spirit. Well, last week, you may recall, we've transitioned to the doctrine of the church. We're going to spend about six weeks here or more on the doctrine of the church, but the, the confession devotes six articles to the doctrine of the church. The church is, is very important, um, uh, according to the confession. Last, last, uh, last week, we, we turned our attention to what we mean when we confess in the Nicene Creed that we we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And so, boys and girls, what, what, what do we mean when we confess the church to be Catholic? What is the, the Catholicity of the church? Anyone know, boys and girls? What does it mean that the church is Catholic? Ezekiel? It's universal. It's universal. Yes, it's universal. And so the term Roman Catholic is an oxymoron. Uh, you can't be a church that is universal and necessarily tied to Rome. Um, now in Article 28, we're thinking about the importance of belonging or being members of this holy and Catholic church. We're thinking about the importance of belonging to this holy and Catholic church. Now this article is very countercultural. <laughs> countercultural when we think about the dominant spirit of our age. For those of you who've been going through our book, Carl Truman's book, a Strange New World, uh, you no doubt have heard the term expressive individualism. Expressive individualism is essentially when an individual grants ultimate authority to his or her feelings. The individual then desires to give outward or public expression to those feelings, and then that person demands that other people and institutions affirm them and celebrate them in those feelings and outward expression of those feelings. Expressive individualism is the air in which is the, the air in which we breathe, and we're all complicit to a certain degree when we, when it comes to this this mindset. Now, for the expressive individualist, the expressive individualist views the church as a platform for self-expression. Uh, the expressive individualist views the church as an institution, merely as a platform for self-expression. The expressive individualist views the visible institutional church as, as really just the gathering of sovereign individuals. This article reminds us that the church, 
the visible church, the institutional church, is instead a vehicle for transformation. We are meant to submit to the church as a vehicle of transformation. And so what do we believe? What do we believe about church membership? What do we believe about church membership? Well, um, I will seek to answer that question as we, as we go along this morning. Uh, we, the, this article answers that question by telling us that we are to join or unite with a church by committing ourselves to three S words. And these S words correspond with our membership vows. We are to profess salvation in Jesus Christ or in the language of the confession, submit our necks to the yoke of Christ. We are to pledge to submit to the church and we are to pledge to serve one another within the church. This is how we join and unite with a local church. We commit ourselves to these three S words, salvation, service, and submission. This is how Article 28 defines church membership for us. You'll notice at the beginning of Article 28, the, the confession says that we are not to withdraw from the church, but rather we are to join or unite with the church regardless of our status or our condition. This means that even, even if you are very theologically astute, even if you have read a lot of theology books and you know a lot about scripture, that does not exempt you from belonging to a local church. This means that even if you like to travel a lot and being a part of a church and going to worship services every Lord's Day is, is quite inconvenient when it comes to your schedule. This does not exempt you from belonging to a church. This means that even if you have many young kids and, and going to church feels much like a chore, this does not exempt you from going to church. Regardless of your status or condition, we all are conscious bound to join or unite with a visible church, a local church, a local expression of Christ's kingdom in our community. So this touches upon this idea, this concept of church membership. Now church membership itself is a biblical term. Paul speaks about us being members, right? Members of the body of Christ. Now Article 28 doesn't use the term uh, church membership, or even member, rather it uses the terms join and unite. Regardless of what term you use, it, it doesn't really matter. The, it's the concept that's important. The concept is what we are to embrace. Now many people will look at Article 28, many people will look at churches like us who still practice church membership and uh, with derision. They, they'll look at uh, look at us and think, you're really going to be that rigid in an age in which participation in organized religion is at an all-time low. You're really going to practice this outdated, seemingly unbiblical um, idea and risk turning people away. Well, yes, we're, we're going to practice this idea because we believe it is biblical. We also believe that it's the only answer to some very important questions that every church needs to ask. What are those questions? Well, how can, how can you distinguish, or how do you distinguish, between a visitor and a member? How does a consistory, how does a body of elders know who they have authority over? Who they are called by God to shepherd and oversee? How do you as members know who you are committed to? Paul in Galatians 6.10 says that you are to do good to everybody, but especially those in the household of faith. A household is a delineated unit. A household, the household of faith is your local church. How do you as a member know who you are called to especially love? Is it those who visit 48 weeks? 48 Sundays out of 52? Is it those who give a certain amount? Is it those who participate in extracurricular activities? How do you make that distinction? These are questions that every church needs to ask and answer. Church membership is the answer. The process of church membership is the answer. 
Churches then need a process in place for individuals to formally commit themselves to a local church so that consistories know who they are accountable for and so that members know who they are committed to. Churches need a process in place for individuals to formally commit to a local church so that consistories know who they are accountable for and members know who they are committed to. What is that process? <laughs> what is that process then? How does one formally commit to a local church? How does one join and unite with a local church? Article 28 answers that question for us. It says that we need to commit ourselves to these three S words. We need to bend our necks under the yoke of Christ or profess salvation in Christ. We need to pledge to submit ourselves to the teaching and discipline of the church. And we need to seek or pledge to serve one another within the church. The way in which we join or unite with a church is by formally committing to these three S words. And so I'd like to take these, uh, these S words in turn. So you'll notice that Article 28 says that we are called to join the church by bending our necks under the yoke of Jesus Christ. The confession here is is alluding to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you, give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for, my, for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke of the law which Jesus is contrasting his yoke to, the yoke of the law is burdensome. The, lo the yoke of the law is heavy. It's crushing. Now, a yoke in the ancient world was something that you would place on the necks of, of, of oxen. The yoke of the law is burdensome. It crushes us. It says, do this and live. Don't do this and be cursed. Uh, we're meant to feel the weight of that law. It's the backdrop for why Jesus came into this world. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Jesus came to bear the curse of the law that our sins have merited. In so doing, Jesus extends to us his yoke. And his yoke is not crushing. His yoke is not heavy. His yoke is easy and light. In Christ, we find rest for our souls. Paul, in, in the book of Romans, says to the Christians who are in Rome, he says, you are no longer under the law. You are no longer under the condemning power of the law, but you are now under grace. Christ is really saying the same thing, but he's using the, the imagery of a yoke. We're no longer under the yoke of the law if we're in Christ. We're under Christ's yoke, and his yoke is easy and light. We obey God out of gratitude. We don't beg, obey God out of fear. When we sin and when we, we mess up, we don't have to fear God's judgment and wrath. We've been delivered from the curse of the law. And so what does it mean? What does it mean to bend our necks under the yoke of Jesus Christ? Well, it means that we find our salvation in Christ. We bend our necks under the yoke of Christ by finding our salvation, submitting ourselves to him as our savior, as our king, as our prophet, as our priest. Now in the context of, of church membership, when we join a church, we publicly profess this. We publicly profess that we are finding our salvation in Jesus Christ. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he he, he, tells, he alludes to Timothy, who in the past had made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Therefore, we join a church, we unite with a church, by publicly professing salvation to be in Jesus Christ. Well, we also join a church by pledging to serve to build up one another according to the gifts God has given us as members of each other in the same body. We are called to serve one another within the body of Christ. This is what Galatians 6, 1 through 10 are all about. Now, before we think about serving each other within the body of Christ, we first need to remember that God serves us. There are some churches 
that refer to Sunday morning, the Sunday morning liturgy as the liturgy of divine service. In fact, many Lutheran churches use this title, a liturgy of divine service. I, I think this is a, a great title. It reminds us that when we gather for corporate worship, we are not serving God. God is serving us. It's divine service. God is serving us through the ministry of word and sacrament when we gather together on the Lord's Day. Again, why did God choose preaching as the medium through which he wants to, uh, he wants to communicate with us? He chose preaching not because he values our intellect over our emotions or our will. God chose preaching as his chosen medium because preaching is an activity in which we are passive and not active. It's an activity in which we are the recipients and not the doers. God is the one who's active in the preaching of the word and we are the passive recipients. Think about baptism. <laughs> now, granted, there, there are people who, who, who baptize themselves, but uh, typically one is baptized by another person, a minister or a pastor. You are the passive recipient in baptism. This communicates to us that God is the actor in baptism. Baptism is not our service to God. It's God's service to us. The Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is not a meal that you prepare. You are not the host of the table of the Lord. You are a guest, an invited guest. Christ is the host and your elders are the waiters. We are the recipients of the word and the sacraments. Worship, then, is God's service to us. Now, after we come to grips with that, we then are to respond to God's divine service by seeking to serve one another within the local church. This is what Paul is speaking about in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. We are to respond to, to the divine service by seeking to serve one another within the body of Christ. We are called to bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ, Paul says. Look again, or, or think with me again, of, of verse 10, which I already alluded to. Paul says that we are to do good to everybody, uh, to your friends, to your family members, to your neighbors, but you are to especially do good to whom? To those within the household of faith, those within your local church. Paul is using the analogy of a natural family. There's a very clear delineation uh, between those who are members of your natural family and those who are not members of your natural family. (laughs) Uh, Boys and girls, if you invite a friend over, it's very clear that that is a friend, that is a guest. Um, That person is not a member of of the family. Being a member of the family uh, comes with it both privileges and responsibilities. This is true uh, for you in your own household, but this is also true within the local church. What's the responsibility? Well, Paul says that we are called to especially love our fellow members. Now, what's the privilege? Well, the privilege is that we are a part of a body who is committed to especially love us. We're part of a family. We're part of a household. And so we join a church by pledging and committing to serve one another with the gifts, the natural, ordinary gifts that God has has granted to us. The last way in which we we join or or unite with a church is by pledging to submit to the church's instruction and discipline. We submit. We submit to the church, to its instruction and discipline. Now, in our call to worship, I read from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. And the author there calls upon all Christians to obey their leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over Uh, over your souls as those who will have to give an account. And let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. The author here is saying that members of the church are to submit to their leaders, to to their consistory. And uh, consistories or elders or pastors are called to shepherd those people who have submitted themselves to, to their care. 
They are to remember that they will have to give an account before God for how they have shepherded those people whom God has entrusted to their care. The author also reminds consistories to, to do this with joy, to, to carry out this weighty task with joy. Now, one of the advantages of being a part of a confessional church, I sometimes call this the confessional advantage. One of the, uh, one of the advantages of, of being a part, or benefits of being a part of a confessional church is that your leaders have limited authority. Your leader's authority has been limited by both God's word and our creeds and confessions. Again, remember what, what Paul says in Titus 1.9. Again, I read this for our call to worship. But Paul says this, he, as he's speaking about, about, about an elder. He says, an elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. Paul doesn't just say that an elder must hold firm to the Bible, to the word. No, Paul says that an elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as it's taught or according to the apostolic hermeneutic. If you were to translate that into our terms today, Paul is saying that an elder must hold firm to the word, the trustworthy word, and as that word has been taught and confessed in the creeds and confessions of the church. Paul continues, and he says it's from that foundation, that foundation of the trustworthy word as taught, that elders and pastors teach sound doctrine and rebuke those who contradict it. It's from that foundation that elders and pastors teach authoritatively and discipline. This means that I only have authority to teach on things that are confessional. The confessions give us our agreed upon interpretation of God's word. If there's something that is outside the purview of our confessional heritage, I don't have the authority as a minister of the word to bind your conscience on that issue. In the same way, your elders do not have the authority to discipline you on something that's not biblical and not confessional. This is, this is a really important aspect of, of church membership and, and, uh, and, and the submission that, that we're calling you to. If one becomes a member of a church that's not confessional, that person is essentially submitting themselves to the elders' ever-involving interpretation of, the, of, of God's word. But that's not what's happening here. You're submitting yourself to the trustworthy word as taught. And so your elders have authority, but it's been limited both by God's word and our confessional documents. And so how do you become a member of the church? Well, you become a member of a church by, by committing to these three S words, by professing salvation publicly before your elders and the body of Christ, by uh, seeking to submit to local elders within a church and by seeking to serve one another within a local body of Christ. You may notice that this aligns with our four membership vows. Our four membership vows can be remembered by four S words. Scripture, salvation, service, and submission. Now that first vow on scripture could really be subsumed under the, the fourth vow of submission because in that first vow we're asking members to submit to scripture and our reformed confession. So membership, membership is the making of a formal commitment to a local expression of Christ's body here on earth. Membership is the making of a formal commitment to a local expression of Christ's body here on earth. It's formal in the sense that it's a commitment that's made under authority and with accountability. An informal commitment uh, possesses no Authority or accountability. A formal commitment is a commitment made under authority and with accountability. And we're committing to these, these three S words. Salvation is in Christ uh, and uh, our pledge to submit and serve the church. Merely attending church regularly does not make one a member of a local church any more than the love and commitment of a dating couple makes them married. 
there is a difference between an informal commitment and a formal commitment. And Article 28 is, is talking about the importance of formally making commitments to one another within a local body of Christ. Now next week, we are going to turn our attention to the marks of a true church. How, how can you know whether a church is a true church, a church of Jesus Christ, a church that God himself recognizes, and merely a human institution? It's that question uh, that we will turn our attention to next week. So let's pray. Merciful Father, we thank you for your church, a church that you established back in Genesis 3, and a church that you continue to build, to preserve, and to protect. And we thank you, O Lord, that you, through your authoritative word and spirit, have made us members of this church. We pray, O Lord, that we would not only view you as our Father, but that we would continue to grow to view your church, your visible church, as our mother. We pray that we would submit to it. We pray that we would um, see its importance, its relevance. Again, we pray for, for our youth and for our children. We pray, O oh Lord, that they would not only grow to profess their faith uh, before the, in the presence of many witnesses, but we pray, O oh Lord, that they would see the value of your visible church, that they would come to recognize that the Christian life is not an individualistic experience, but it's a communal experience. Oh Lord, we also lift up the, the needs of your body, uh, the needs of your body here gathered. We pray for Ben as he will be away on a training exercise in California for the rest of this month. We, we pray that you grant him strength. We also pray for Leah. We pray that you would grant her what she stands in need of. Um, we pray that you bless their marriage during this time in which they're apart. Uh, we also pray for, uh, for Maya as she's not feeling well. We pray that you would um, uh, grant her strength. We pray that you would heal her body. We pray that you would especially uh, heal her body before this next weekend as they have a play coming up. We pray that you guard her from anxiety and worry. Oh Lord, we also pray for Britain's co-worker Luke. Um, again, we're saddened by, by this news of, of such a young man receiving this, this, this terminal um, uh, this terminal disease and, and uh, tumor. We just pray that that your comfort would be upon him, O oh Lord. We pray that you would renew his hope in the new creation, the resurrection of the body, the age to come. We pray that you comfort his wife and his family during this, this very difficult and trying time. May you um, cause them to, to grieve with hope, hope that they will one day again be re reunited. Um, o oh Lord, we also commit to you the other needs of your body. We, we know that you are a providential Heavenly Father and you delight to not only hear the needs of your people but to answer answer the requests of your people. And so we ask that you do so now. We ask all these things in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand as we respond uh, to, to God's word by lifting up our voices. now God's blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.